much. Hello, Justice Ginsburg. You do us all such great honor here in Buffalo. So in honor of my first question is to tell you that we're quite grateful to our good friend Wayne Wisbaum for helping us bring you to Buffalo and we're touched by Joanne Folletta's comments and tribute. Before we jump into our other questions, can you share something about your friendship with Wayne? Wayne was, I think, in the class below mine at Cornell. His sister was the class above mine. Wayne, every time he came to D.C. to attend American Law Institute meetings, stopped in my chambers uh, to say the same thing, please come to Buffalo. <laughs> and he was persistent. It, it is my great sorrow that he's not here with us this evening. But when I promised him I would come, I didn't know that this day would be preceded by three weeks of daily radiation. But I said, I will not cancel Buffalo. <laughs> this place, by the way, is so beautiful. What an extraordinary concert hall. I think it's going to be remembered for you here tonight as well. <laughs> so thank you for helping Klein Hands um, with our legacy and Buffalo. You have lived a storied life, and we are going to start off with a clip from one of your movies and ask you a question. As a female law student in the 1950s, you faced many challenges. Let's take a look at a clip. How did it feel to be one of nine women in a class of over 500 men. You felt you were constantly on display. So if you were called on in class, you felt that if you didn't perform well, you were failing not just for yourself, but for all women. You also had the uncomfortable feeling that you were being watched. When I was sent to check a periodical in Lamont Library in the old periodical room, there was a man at the door and he said, you can't come in. Oh, why can't I? Because you're a female. There was nothing I could say. This was a university uh, employee that, that you, you can't come into that room. And then there was the Dean's famous dinner for the women in the first year class. He asked each of us to stand up and tell him what we were doing, taking a seat that could be occupied by a man. So the question on everyone's mind is, how did you respond to the Harvard Dean? <laughs> uh, it was one of those moments when you wished you had a trap door to fall through. <laughs> this was Dean Erwin Griswold, and it was his tradition to invite all the women in the first year class each of us had an escort, a distinguished professor. Mine was Herbert Wexler, who was visiting from Columbia. He was a man who looked more like God than anyone I'd ever seen. <laughs> In those days, we didn't know how bad it was to smoke, so Professor Wexler and I were sharing an ashtray. It was on my lap. And when I got up to respond to the dean's question, there were the cigarette butts, cigarette butts <laughs> all over the living room floor. I was mortified. So I gave him a, an answer that I didn't believe in that he didn't want to hear. And I said, Dean Griswold, my husband is in the second year class, and I think it's very important for a woman to understand her husband's work. <laughs> Sat down. I had a brave classmate, Flora Schnall, who said, Dean Griswold, there were nine of us, 
Well, really only eight because Ruth Ginsburg doesn't count for this purpose. <laughs> there are over 500 of them. What better place to find a man? <laughs> but the dean, who was not known for his sense of humor, <laughs> years later explained to me that he didn't ask the question to wound or insult. Harvard didn't begin admitting women until 1950. So this was 1956. And they were still doubting Thomases on the faculty who thought women didn't belong there. So he wanted to be armed with stories from the women themselves about what they would do with their Harvard Law School degree. I think you did pretty well. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> but. I'm going to turn this over now to you, talking about women, to the president of the, woman, the Western New York chapter of the Women's Bar, Elizabeth Fox Solomon. Justice Western and Central New York were home to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other important women in the women's suffrage movement. And nationwide, we're preparing to celebrate uh, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Is there a woman who inspired you and to pursue a career in law? Who inspired me? And not in my early years, because women were barely there. They were 3% of the bar across the country. They were perhaps 1% of the judges nationwide. The law was not a friendly field for women in those days. So it wasn't until years later that I met or heard about women that would have been inspirational if I knew of them earlier. And one that I spoke about uh, this afternoon is Belva Lockwood, who applied for admission to the Supreme Court Bar in 1876. Her application was denied six to three. She possessed all the necessary qualifications. There was just one thing wrong. She was a woman. Belva Lockwood spent the next three years lobbying Congress relentlessly. And in 1879, Congress passed a law saying, women who possess the necessary qualifications must be admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court. So it's one example that sometimes the legislature is more in tune with the changing society than the court is. <laughs> There's a very good biography of Belva Lockwood by Jill Norgren. It tells of her, what did she do after becoming a member of the Supreme Court Bar? Well, she ran for president of the United States twice, in 1884 and in 1888. People were astonished. They said, how can you run for public office when you can't even vote? And she said, well, I, here's my constitution, my pocket constitution. I don't see anything in here that says I can't run for president. She argued in the Supreme Court twice, one in the very year she was admitted, and the last when she was well into her 70s. She argued on behalf of the Cherokee Indians who had been displaced from their ancestral land in Georgia and marched on the Vale of Tears to Oklahoma. She won a huge award, compensation award for them. Another woman that I did have the good fortune to meet was the first woman ever appointed to a federal district court judgeship. And she was Bernita Shelton Matthews appointed by President Truman to the bar in 
to the district court for the District of Columbia. She had been counsel to the National Women's Party, and she was working during the day, going to law school at night, and picketing the White House with her sign, Votes for Women. <laughs> she said she would never respond if the police hassled her because she didn't want to risk being arrested and having a, a record that might impede her admission to the bar. When Chief Justice Taft got the idea that the Supreme Court should have its own home, until 1935, the Supreme Court was housed inside the Capitol. President Taft's view was that the judiciary is an independent branch of government. The Supreme Court should have its own home. But there was a problem. On the site where the Supreme Court now stands was the headquarters of the National Women's Party. Bernita Shelton Matthews was a specialist in eminent domain. <laughs> she said this is very valuable property. For one thing, it was the temporary capital when the capital was burned in the War of 1812. And then she said in civil war years, it was a jail for notorious Confederate spies. Well, the government insisted it was just a ramshackle old building until Bernita Shelton Matthews presented in evidence a photograph of a notorious Confederate spy who happened to be a woman inside that building. At that point, the government decided it would rather switch than fight on and, and paid what was the largest condemnation award that the government had ever paid up until that time to the National Women's Party. She was in her 90s when I joined the DC Circuit and we met periodically. She was a woman from Mississippi with a soft southern drawl. She wore lace collars and cuffs on her robe, but she was made of steel. <laughs> she explained why she engaged only women as her law clerks. She said, because my colleagues engage only men. And she maintained that she always had the best law clerks on the DC District Court. It is difficult sometimes to understand why the concept of women's full participation in society was ever in doubt. Perhaps we can do a little context here on attitude towards women in the professions, particularly law. Let's start with the 1870s. In Bradwell versus Illinois, a woman, Myra Bradwell, had appealed to be admitted to the bar. A Supreme Court justice, Justice Joseph Bradley, wrote in a concurring opinion against her appeal, this is a quote, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. Now one wonders how Justice Bradley communed with the creator. <laughs> The, the state of Illinois was so secure that Myra Bradwell's appeal would fail that they didn't even bother to send a representative to argue the case against her. So how did we get from there to here? So, well, a lot uh, had happened since Myra Bradwell's 
stay. The bar was still not uh, family friendly, but as women came into the profession in increasing numbers, other women gained the courage to go to law school. I started teaching law at Rutgers Law School in 1963. My first year civil procedure class had 100 students. Five were women. It really wasn't until 1972 that the big breakthrough came. And it came about in part because law schools across the country were worried about losing male students to the Vietnam draft. So they over-admitted women. And then when the women were there, other women were encouraged to, to follow after and there was no return to the not so good old days. <laughs> In 1972, it was the year of the women. Uh, law schools across the country wanted to engage a woman for the faculty. But nowadays, uh, I'm just exhilarated to see women on law school faculties, even deans like you, and women as students, as law students, often 50% or more of entering classes. So the closed door era is, is indeed over. Yes, things are not perfect, but how long away we have traveled. When you think of 1959, I graduated from law school. I have pretty good grades. There was not a law firm in the entire city of New York that gave me an offer for a permanent job. My dear colleague, Sandra Day O'Connor, graduated from Stanford Law School a few years earlier. She was asked if she could type and she might get a job as a legal secretary. So what did she do? She went to a county attorney and said, I will work for you without pay for four months. If at the end of that time you think I'm worth it, you can put me on the payroll. For women, it was getting that first job that was all important. Because once the woman got a job, she did it at least as well as the men, and the next, the next step was not, not so hard. Perhaps you can describe your years as an ACLU advocate. Oh. It was the busiest and most satisfying time in my life up till then. And I saw that there really was a possibility to move the court in the direction of recognizing the equal citizenship stature of women. You know, the court's record was not good up until that time. There was in Nine, well, you mentioned Myra Bradwell's case, but in 1948, the state of Michigan passed a law that said women could not tend bars unless they were the daughter or the wife of a male bar owner. There was a mother-daughter team, the Gossarts. The mother owned the tavern. Her daughter was her bartender, and that law would have put them out of business immediately. 
That case came to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the law in a rather flippant opinion, talking about, yes, women and alcohol are mixed for years. Think of Chaucer's old alewife. <laughs> and then switch to how dangerous bars were, never recognizing that there was no ban on the woman serving as barmaids, mm -hmm. predecessors to bunnies, the ones who brought the drinks to the tables. <laughs> Bartender is protected behind, behind the, the bar. Well, that's how the court responded in 1948. And then in as late as 1961, now we are before the, quote, liberal Warren Court, and a woman from Florida, Gwendolyn Hoyt, a, a woman we would now call abused or battered. Uh, one day she was having a fight with her philandering, abusive husband and she spied her son's baseball bat in the corner of the room. She picked it up and with all her might, hit her husband over the head. He fell to the floor, it was the end of their fight and the beginning of the murder prosecution. <laughs> she was from Hillsborough County in Florida where women were not on the jury rolls. And Gwendolyn Hoyt's attitude was, if I had women on the jury, I, I wouldn't expect to be acquitted, but they might convict me of the lesser crime of manslaughter instead of murder. Well, she was convicted of murder by an all-male jury, and when her case came to the Supreme Court in 1961, uh, the court's attitude was, we don't know what these women are complaining about. They have the best of all possible worlds. If they want to serve on a jury, they can sign up in the clerk's office. But if they don't want to serve, no one will bother them, they won't be called. You can imagine Gwendolyn Hoyt's reaction to that. What about me? I'm a, a, a woman. In 1971, the no longer, quote, liberal Burger Court in, in a series of cases struck down gender classification after gender classification. And how do you explain the difference? It's because society had changed. I can explain it even in terms of my children. And my daughter was born in 1955, and I was one of few working moms in, in her, her grade school class. My son was born 10 years later, in 1965, and it wasn't at all unusual then to have a true earner family. So society had changed, and eventually the court caught up with that, with that change. And when I realized that that could happen, and I thought of women, one of them was Dorothy Kenyon, another Pauli Murray, who had made the same arguments unsuccessfully, arguments that became winners in the 70s. So in the Turning Point gender discrimination case, Read v. Read, I put their names on the brief, even though they were well past the age where they could contribute, because I knew we were standing on their shoulders. We were making the same arguments they were making at a time when society was not yet ready to listen. So we were on a roll, really. Um, by the end of the 70s, almost all the explicit gender-based classifications in the law were over, were held unconstitutional, either in the state courts, or by the Supreme Court. So to be, to have a chance to be part of that effort, or one effort 
was to get the U.S. Code to stop using gender-specific pronouns, which were mostly he. So there was a review of all the provisions of the U.S. Code to render them gender neutral. So instead of police man, it was police officer. Um, firemen became firefighters. But the difference between my success in the 70s and the lack of success of women earlier was just that, that the way people were living had changed. And so the law was bound to catch up with, with that change. I think that is a good segue for us for another video clip. Let's look at what was said by both Republicans and Democrats when you were nominated to the Supreme Court. She was put on the court by a liberal president uh, as a liberal justice. And that's the way this country works. I disagree with you on a number of things, and I'm sure you disagree with me. But that isn't the issue, is it? And frankly, I admire you. You've earned the right, in my opinion, to be on the Supreme Court. She was confirmed 96 to 3. Now, it, you would argue it was not as partisan a time as it is now, but it was pretty partisan. What's your assessment of the current nominating and approval process for federal judges? <laughs> but you, you just saw a clip from 1993 when there was a true bipartisan spirit in our Congress. Joe Biden was the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Orrin Hatch was the ranking minority member. And Orrin Hatch was my biggest supporter. My White House handlers were very worried about my ACLU connection. So to prepare me for the hearing, they asked questions like, you were on the ACLU board in the year whatever. That year they passed this or that resolution. How did you vote? And I said, just stop it. Because this is, it is nothing that you could say that would lead me to criticize the ACLU. At the hearing, not a single question was asked <laughs> about my ACLU connection. Today, that would not be the case. Today, I fear that Orrin Hatch would not be in my corner. It was the same way the next year, 1994, when Justice Stephen Breyer was nominated. Again, uh, over 90% ap approval in the Senate. In recent years, and it's on both sides of the aisle, it's fallen apart. So people who are highly qualified including my current chief, got several negative votes. Uh, Justices Sotomayor and Justice Kagan also got a substantial number of negative votes, having nothing to do with their qualifications for being a fine jurist. Now, I hope one day there will be people who care about our country, both Democrats and Republicans, who will come together and say, enough of this dysfunctional legislature. We're supposed to serve the people of the United States. So I, I hope we will see once again the way judges sh should be uh, confirmed. Some have recently called for expanding the number of justices on the court. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a very bad idea. <laughs> you know, it was tried once by FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
He was so frustrated by what they called the nine old men who were striking down social and economic legislation uh, intended to help us over the Depression that his idea was any justice who remains past the age of 70. For every such justice, there could be a justice added. If that court packing plan had passed, the court would have immediately increased from nine to 15, and Roosevelt would have appointed a majority. But cooler heads prevailed, and that court packing plan failed, as I hope current plans in the legislative hopper will fail. So for our next question, we're going to turn to uh, Bridget O'Connell, the president of the Bar Association of Erie County. Justice, one of your close relationships has been with Sandra Day O'Connor. You once quoted her as saying, suppose we had come of age at a time when women lawyers were welcome at the bar. Today, we would be retired partners from some large law firm. But because that route was not open to us, we had to find another way, and we both ended up United States Supreme Court justices. <laughs> Can you describe your relationship with Justice O'Connor? She was the closest that I came to being a big sister. There is a wonderful biography of Justice O'Connor called First by Evan Thomas, and it reveals something that the rest of us never knew. When it was rumored that when they were at Stanford Law School, she occasionally dated later Chief Justice Rehnquist. But as the book tells the story, not only did they date, but he came to the Lazy Bee, the ranch where she lived, and he proposed to her. When he was clerking for uh, Justice Robert Jackson, he wrote to her, and and said, I want to spend my life with you. Please marry me this summer. But by then, she had met John O'Connor, who she preferred. <laughs> <laughs> but she did, she, she had promised Rehnquist that she would go with him to Yellowstone, it, which she did. Then, um, after Stanford, both couples then Nan Rehnquist, uh, who married the later Chief Justice, and John and Sandra went off to Phoenix, Arizona. And they were close friends there. When Rehnquist was nominated to be chief, Sandra and John O'Connor helped organize a, a, a campaign support for his, for his nomination. But she, neither of them ever ever revealed how close their relationship once was. <laughs> and how important was she to you when you arrived at the court? How did she? How important was she to you when you arrived uh, at the court? Well, she told me what she thought I needed to know to navigate those first few weeks. She didn't douse me with a kettle full of information, just what she thought was necessary. And at the end of the first sitting, I got an assignment. Now the rumor was that the junior justice first assignment will be a single issue case in which the court is unanimous. Instead, Chief Justice Rehnquist assigned me to a miserable ERISA case. <laughs> Uh, ERISA, for those who don't know, is one of the most complex laws Congress ever wrote. So I went to Sandra to complain and said, he wasn't supposed to do that to me. <laughs> and she said in her usual way, Ruth, you just do it. Just do it. And have your opinion in circulation before he makes the next set of assignments Otherwise, you're going to risk getting another 
unpleasant case. <laughs> that, was, that was her attitude for everything in life. Just do it. I mean, the way she dealt with her breast cancer. At nine days after a mastectomy, she was on the court. And she was a brave and a wonderful woman. Oh, there was one incident in our relationship. So it was a, during oral argument, and Sandra had asked a couple of questions. I thought she was finished. So I chimed in and asked a question, and she said, just a minute, I'm not done. <laughs> the next day in USA Today, there's a headline, Rude Ruth Interrupts. So, <laughs> so and, and I, I apologized to Sandra immediately for stepping on her question. She said, Ruth, don't think about it for a minute. The guys do it to each other all the time. Well, the, the reporter who wrote about Ruth Ruth, I made that comment to him. And to his credit, he watched the court proceeding, and he said, you know, you're right. The guys do interrupt each other, but we didn't notice it when it was, when it was two, two men. Then there was a linguist or, um, at Georgetown who wanted to be helpful by explaining how this occurred, how I interrupted Sandra. And she, it, it was to this effect. Justice O'Connor is a laid back girl of the Golden West. Justice Ginsburg is a fast talking girl from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> but people who knew us knew that Sandra got out two words to my every one. There's another example of the stereotype of the way people, the way people are. She gave me great advice when I had colorectal cancer. She said, for one thing, I schedule the chemotherapy for Friday. That way you can get over it in the weekend and be back in court in the morning. And then she said, you're going to get dozens in those days letters don't even try to respond just concentrate on the court's business and give it give it your all we have a we have a related question we turn now to Brittany uh, Brittany Jones, president of the Minority Bar Association of Western New York, with a follow-up. You've often said that the time when you were the only female justice on the court after Justice O'Connor stepped down was hard for you. Why, and is it different now? Um, is it different now? Yes, it certainly is. Why? Because when I was the lone woman, it projected the wrong image of the court. We'd come out on the bench, and there were these eight rather well-fed men. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was this rather thin woman. So. <laughs> Three makes a big difference. And we are all over the bench, because I've been there so long, I'm, I sit next to the chief, with Justice Sotomayor on one side and Justice Kagan on the other. Anyone who has watched argument at the court knows that my sisters-in-law are not shrinking violets. <laughs> They're very active in the colloquy that goes on. And it's good for the children, and we have a 10-minute line of uh, children coming in and out of the courtroom just to get a glimpse of how we operate. And for them to see, we were a third of the bench, we are all over the bench, and the women are very active in, in, in the conversation that goes on. 
an oral argument. People ask, when will there be enough? The obvious answer is when there are nine. question. Your relationship and friendship with Justice Anton Scalia were the stuff of legend and some surprise. Let's take a look. They are the leading voices of opposite points of view on the United States Supreme Court. Why don't you call us the odd couple? <laughs> <laughs> he is a very funny fellow. She's a, a very nice person. She likes opera. You know, what's not to like? Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> How did two such ideological opposites become friends? We first met when Justice Scalia was teaching at the University of Chicago Law School. Administrative law was his field. I think he was the head of ACUS, the Administrative Conference of the United States. And he was there to inveigh against a recent decision uh, rendered by the D.C. Circuit. Vermont Yankee was the case. I disagreed with most of what he said, but I was utterly charmed by the way he said it. <laughs> His wit was so sharp. And then we were together on the D.C. Circuit for some years before he was appointed to the Supreme Court. And so it was a three-judge bench. He would sit next to me, and he'd whisper something that was so funny. I had all I could do to contain hilarious laughter. <laughs> Although our approach to reading legal texts was certainly different, <laughs> we both cared a lot about good writing, about not only getting it right, but keeping it clear and concise. So he labored over his opinions as I do mine. But every now and then he would call me or come to chambers and say, uh, Ruth, you made a grammatical error. I don't want to point it out to all of our colleagues, but you should fix it. Well. And, Nino was billed as the child of, a, of an Italian immigrant from Sicily. That is true. But his father was also a professor of Latin mm. at Brooklyn College. And his mother was a grammar school teacher. He was an only child. Um, so he was a very good grammarian. Sometimes I would say to him, you know, this opinion is so over the top, you'll be more persuasive if you tone it down. He never took that advice. <laughs> Thank you. The 14th and 15th Amendments guarantee the right to vote for all citizens, and the Voting Rights Act sets forth provisions to ensure that right. Two recent decisions, Shelby County versus Holder and Ruscio versus Common Cause, each limited the right to vote. You wrote the dissent in Shelby County. Let's watch a clip. It's considered one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation ever passed. But by five to four, the U.S. Supreme Court today took the teeth out of a law enacted nearly 50 years ago. The Voting Rights Act has policed voting discrimination. But today's decision effectively puts it on hold. Chief Justice John Roberts summarized his opinion in four telling words. Our country has changed. Justice Ginsburg has filed a dissenting opinion. Race-based voting discrimination still exists. This fourth decision is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. Can you... Can you explain what you meant by that? 
the Voting Rights Act of 1965 passed by overwhelming majorities, and it had a formula. The formula was, if you are a state or a county or a city that had a record of racial discrimination in access to the ballot, you can make no change in your voting laws unless you get preclearance from the Department of Justice or from a three-judge district court in, in the District of Columbia. That law was working very effectively because it stopped discriminatory laws be before they became uh, effective. Well, years went by since 1965, and the majority's view in the Shelby County case was this formula, the states, cities, counties included, are not necessarily discriminators today. So the idea is okay, but Congress has to redo which states, cities, counties should be covered. Now, the notion that that was going to happen, and by the way, the Voting Rights Act had been renewed periodically, again, overwhelming majorities, Democrats and Republicans alike. Now, what member of Congress is going to stand up and say, my city is still keeping African Americans from voting? Congress was not equipped to do anything about that, about changing the formula, but the law itself had an exit route. And that was, if your city or county or state had been free from discrimination for X number of years, you could bail out. So that was a, a cure for localities that were no longer discriminating. They could get out through the bailout procedure. And Congress put the bailout provision there for that very reason. But it was um, beyond the realm to think that Congress would redefine which localities were covered, and that's exactly what happened. As soon as, as, soon as there was no more preclearance, we began to see efforts to deter people we don't want to vote from having access to the polls through various devices. Uh, voter IDs, closing polling places, shortening the hours when people can vote, all laws that would have been denied preclearance. So I think it was a grave mistake on the court's part to decide Shelby County as it did. And, and Ruccio is the partisan gerrymandering case where district courts had been, been able to identify extremes. Not every gerrymander, but let's take North Carolina, where the, the popular vote was more or less equal between Democrats and Republicans. Yet they end up with a congressional delegate, delegation with 10 Republicans and three Democrats. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be that the voters choose their representatives. And here are representatives drawing district lines so that they are choosing their voters. Uh, something is, is wrong with our political system. When people live in districts,
And, and the court, by the way, didn't, didn't say this is right and proper. It just said the court is not the proper party to fix it, that it was a political question, not a question for the judiciary. Recently, you wrote what is likely to be another iconic dissent in American Legion versus American Humanist Association, in which the majority ruled that a 40-foot World War I memorial cross can remain on public land at a Maryland intersection. You argued that the cross could not be considered a secular symbol and said, quote, as I see it, when a cross is displayed on public property, the government may be presumed to endorse its religious content and the venue is surely associated with the state. The symbol and its meaning are just as surely associated exclusively with Christianity. Can you describe that case? Well, it was a giant cross that had been erected in 1925 as a memorial to the people from the county who had died in World War I. Um, The cross is surely not a secular symbol. It is the preeminent symbol of Christianity and no other faith. Suppose you're driving by in, in the car with your kids and you see that giant cross and you're not Christian, you feel an outsider, a left out. Now, no one suggested that you would have to destroy the cross. It could have been moved to private land. In this case, the American Legion sponsored, sponsored it, could have moved it to private land. Or the property could be conveyed to a private party. But the idea is we have an establishment clause that says the government is not supposed to mix with religion. It's not supposed to ally itself with any one or another religious faith. So that was, it was a minority view. Only Justice Sotomayor joined me in that dissent, but I did feel very strongly about it, as I did about the Hobby Lobby, my Hobby Lobby dissent. And in that case was a very successful employer who refused to provide contraceptive coverage for their employees. And the argument was we are a deeply religious couple we do not believe in birth control, and we don't want to make a benefit available that, that in our view, should not exist. But if you're in business to make a profit, you're supposed to serve the entire community, and it was fine if there were women who didn't want that coverage, they didn't have to have it. But most of their workforce did not share their religious beliefs. And that's why I used the example. I said, you can exercise your freedom of religion to the hilt until your arm hits the other fellow's nose. That is. What exactly does that mean? when it hits your nose. It, 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 it means that you're hurting someone else. That you, you can practice your religion and that's fine. But if what you're doing is harmful to people who, are, who do not share your religious views, then that's, that's off limits. So here are all, the women working at the store next door received contraceptive coverage if they wanted it and the Hobby Lobby staff did not, even though, as I said, most of them were not uh, affiliated with that religious belief. 
We turn now to Scott Becker, who is president of the UB Law Alumni Association, and he has another question related, uh, he has a question related to the legal profession. Lawyers often face challenges to staying well when integrating the demands of practice and family. What advice do you have for lawyers when they face that challenge of juggling family with, with mm -hmm. their legal responsibilities? No, I say it, it is a really unfortunate if in your zeal to work all kinds of hours, you miss out on the joys as well as the burdens of raising the next generation. And I know it doesn't have to be that way. Um, my husband was the head of the tax department in a large New York City law firm where the people in the antitrust department and the bankruptcy department was there all hours of the day and night. But in the tax department, all of the lawyers were gone by seven because Marty set the tone for the way his department should operate. And they were as much a profit center as any other. But you can arrange your work efficiently so you can get it done. And we made an agreement that unless something urgent came up, we would have dinner together as a family. And I think my children were truly blessed by having two caring parents. But I'll tell you a funny story about about my son, who was what I called lively, and what his what his teachers called uh, what do they call hyperactive, <laughs> <laughs> and periodically I would be called. These were the days I was teaching at Columbia Law School. Come down to see the headmaster, or the room teacher, or the school psychologist <laughs> to hear about your son's latest escapade. So one day when I got such a call, I'd stayed up all night writing a brief and I was really weary. I said to the caller, this child has two parents. Please alternate calls. <laughs> And, and it's his father's turn. So <laughs> they did call Marty, he came down and was confronted by his three stone faces reporting that James had stolen the elevator. The school had one of those hand-operated elevators and my son, who was then in the sixth grade, was challenged by one of his classmates to take the kindergarten class up to the top floor. <laughs> So Marty's response is, so he stole the elevator. How far could he take it? <laughs> now, I don't know whether it was Marty's wit or the reluctance of the school to take a man away from his work. There was no quick change in my son's behavior. But the call came barely once a semester because they thought twice about calling a father away from his work and didn't think at all about calling a mother. Anyway, that child turned out to be a fine human <laughs> <laughs> and himself a very good parent of two daughters. The legal system and lawyers seem to be constantly under fire. Most of those who work in the legal system, however, realize that it works in the vast majority of cases. Would you encourage your grandchildren to attend law school and become practicing lawyers? 
The answer, no. the answer is, without a doubt, yes, because my daughter is a lawyer. She is a world-respected expert in copyright and trademark. She teaches at Columbia Law School, and she just won a big case in the Second Circuit. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter graduated from law school two years ago. She clerked first for a district judge in the Southern District of New York, Denise Cote. And now she's just completing a clerkship with Chief Judge Robert Katzman. And she is very enthousi enthusiastic about prospects to repair some tears in our world by, by practicing, practicing law. Your image has appeared on t-shirts, comic books, coloring books, and tattoos. Children dress up as you for History Day at school. To what do you attribute your popularity with young people? Well, first, I attribute it to a second year student at NYU Law School who, when, she, when the Supreme Court rendered the Shelby County decision that we just talked about, she was dismayed and then decided that being angry was not going to do anything productive. So she invented this tumbler. Tumbler, yes. And she called it the notorious RBG. <laughs> after <laughs> Well, as this audience certainly knows, she took the name from the notorious B.I.G. <laughs> and she said, well, those two have something very important in common. Well, what does Justice Ginsburg have to do with the notorious B.I.G.? They were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> anyway, I think the idea took off because people are looking for something hopeful. They're looking for an upbeat story as a counter to the news that is depressing. Mm -hmm. Looks like that we are actually moving towards our last question. Um, you've said, which, and this is a quote, I do think I was born under a very bright star. How did you come to see life's obstacles as challenges? One, by following, following some very good advice I got from my father-in-law. I was married to a man who was unusual for his time. This is, we were married in 1954. And he was the first boy I ever knew that cared that I had a brain. One of my classmates at Cornell said, you're so lucky because Marty is so secure in his own self that he will never regard you as any kind of challenge. On the contrary, he will be your biggest booster, as he, as he was. But in 1955, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was somewhat worried. How could I start law school with an infant to care for? And my father-in-law said, if you decide not to go to law school, no one will think the less of you. It's an okay choice to make. But if you really want to be a lawyer, you will pick yourself up and you will find a way. And that advice I've used at several turns in my life. 
do I want this badly enough? And if the answer is yes, then I find a way. Justice Ginsburg, thank you so much. It has been a true honor to share this evening and day with you and our legal community. Um, Brittany Jones, president of the Minority Bar Association of Western New York, will now provide the evening's closing remarks. I have learned an incredible amount. Thank you. Fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Those are the words of Justice Ginsburg. It is our duty to continue to fight for the things that matter to us, for equality in our legal profession, for equality in our community, and for equal justice under the law. As president of the Minority Bar Association of Western New York, it has been an honor to be here with all of you in the presence of this incredible woman this evening. The Minority Bar Association is an organization comprised of minority attorneys in Western New York. The purpose of our organization is to facilitate and advance equality and excellence in the legal profession, aid in the progress of minorities in the legal profession, address legal issues affecting minorities, advocate for the civil rights of all people, and to enhance the legal services available to minority communities. On behalf of the legal community and the greater Buffalo community, thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Thank you.